greetings we will uh, begin with a new topic today and this is a very exciting one on the theory of relativity einstein's name is of course intimately associated with this theory for good reasons means he made huge contributions to physics uh, there are so many branches of physics for which einstein's work turns out to be pioneering in respective areas and this is certainly one of those. <coughs> uh, this topic we will cover in about uh, 4 lecture hours and the subject is vast. Uh, regardless it shall be my endeavor to give a gist of the essential ideas introducing you to the special theory of relativity. And I have chosen to incorporate this topic in this undergraduate course which is given as one of the first courses after high school because as you will realize the consequences of the theory of relativity are crucial for almost every scientific engineering and technological endeavor. So, all scientists, physics, physicists, chemists, material scientists, engineers, they all need to have a reasonable familiarity with the theory of relativity, which is why it needs to be uh, introduced at an early stage of education, which is why this topic has been incorporated at this stage. Our learning goals will be relatively modest but we will discover that the speed of light being finite has important consequences on our understanding of space and time. Finiteness of the speed of light is something that we do not always really recognize in our day to day ex experience because the moment you you know light a candle you see the light it is so fast so rapid that the idea that there is something called as the speed of light is almost alien to human experience because we are we think that it it, it is almost instantaneous I mean we think of speed when we think about an object in motion you and I are walking you faster than me, but nevertheless there are speeds that we talk about or we talk about speeds of you know people running or vehicles different kinds of vehicles cars, aeroplanes, jets there are different speeds, but it is in the context of such objects motion of such objects that we talk about speed. That it is an idea which has an important implication in the context of light is something that we do not normally think about and we will learn that this is an important consideration. What it will force us to reconcile with is what we regard as simultaneous also has to be reinterpreted because the notion of simultaneity has almost some kind of an intuitive meaning in our minds which to all of us although we do, do not define it in objective terms is almost equivalent and whenever you know one observer thinks that two events have taken place simultaneously almost any observer in his vicinity would arrive at the same conclusion that those two events are simultaneous regardless of the relative motion between these two observers. What we will learn is that this intuitive idea of simultaneity needs to be refined. So, we will discuss that. What this will lead us to 
is the notion that what we call as length, the distance between the tip, this tip and this tip and also what we talk about the time interval like the time you took to come to the class from whenever you started. And from wherever you started, you covered a certain distance in a certain amount of time and that gives you your perception of what you interpret for yourself as your length interval and your time interval. And we grow up through our schools and high schools thinking that this notion of length and time interval is essentially the same for each one of us regardless of our state of relative motion with each other. But this idea also has to be defined. We will then learn about Lorentz transformations and how these account for the consequences of the special theory of relativity. These are actually consequences of the way nature is are not consequences of a given theory. The theory itself is a consequence of the laws of nature. So, we often say that okay, there is length contraction because of the special theory of relativity. No, there is length contraction because that is how nature can best be understood and it is a special theory of relativity which tells us how it needs to be understood. So, we will learn about Lorentz transformations, how are these account for length contraction and time dilation. I will illustrate these ideas of length contraction and time dilation with the reference of a rather exciting problem which is rather famous. It is famously known as the Twint paradox and I will come to that presumably in the third class out third out of the four class hours that I intend to spend on this. And then I will also introduce you to some other fascinating consequences of the theory of relativity. Like I mentioned the subject is vast and it shall not be my endeavor to go beyond these modest goals. There are important implications leading to electromagnetic field equations, then there is this general theory of relativity. Uh, I will make a few remarks on how this affects the global positioning system and so on and how this affects our day to day life. Okay, so, whenever we compare speeds, I think the most fascinating debate is not between Pepsi and Coke, but between Camaro and Mustang because young people they always you know they want to buy a car and a muscle car and uh, you know which is a better car which will go faster which will get to a speed from 0 to 100 in the least time. And you are talking about speeds how much distance is covered in how much time and these are the important considerations in our minds. So, when we talk about speed, we need to measure it and here you have a speed gun okay? and with the speed gun let us say you are measuring the speed of a car and even if you are driving at 152 kilometers per hour, you hope that you would not be caught, but that is a different matter. <coughs> So, here is a speed gun a traffic officer records a speed of 152 kilometers per hour in his speed gun and he is looking at the speeds of two cars which are going on a road. Now, if the competition gets tough this can have interesting consequences. 
But what is important is that if the vehicle is moving at a constant speed, if you have the vehicle which is moving at a constant speed like 152 kilometers per hour <coughs> and maybe you use cruise control or something and then the car keeps going steady, the vehicle keeps going steady, there is no acceleration, there is no change of direction. But uniform speed with respect to the traffic officer. Then we know from Galileo that the state of motion at constant speed with constant momentum is completely equivalent to the mechanical state of rest. That is Galileo's law of inertia, which gets incorporated in Newton's scheme as the first law of inertia. So, in other words, if you have if you are watching a game, Brett Lee versus Sachin Tendulkar, one of the most exciting competitions in cricket, and you are watching this game, and this game could be played just as well on the platform of a truck, if it is large enough, as long as the truck is moving at a constant velocity. Okay, if the truck is moving at a constant velocity, there is no acceleration, the speed remains invariant, the direction remains invariant, you are not turning the vehicle. As long as there is no acceleration, this game could be played just as well on the platform of a truck, which is large enough, let us say. And if you measure the speeds now, now let us ask the question who is measuring the speed, the speed of watts. And here we have Bretley bowling at a speed of 152 kilometers per hour. <coughs> so, we are talking about these speeds in the framework of Galilean relativity. And here is a speed or speed gun which is installed on the truck okay. and this speedometer will record the speed of the ball to be at 152 kilometers an hour. Now, suppose the tr truck itself I think I jumped yeah, suppose the truck itself is moving at 152 kilometers per hour in this direction and the speed is measured by a speedometer which is mounted on the ground. Then what is going to be the speed recorded over here in this speedometer of the ball that is bowled by Brett Lee? Yes, it will be, well he is bowling backward, the truck is going forward, 0. And if Tendulkar was to wait, he will need to wait forever. You know, he keeps saying the ball was coming up to my bat, that never would happen. But then this observer who is not on the track also sees the rest of the ground, okay, the whole playground, including the stumps, Tendulkar, and everything moving up. And his observations will be exactly the same as the observations of the observer on the truck. So, these ideas will become quite clear as we discuss this further. This is a nice truck with the usual messages on its tail. At these speeds can be quite high. The tangential equatorial speed for example, this is like 1650 kilometers per hour, <coughs> excuse me. So, one really has to take into account some of these effects. In addition to that, the earth has got an orbital speed and then the whole solar system is moving in the galaxy. 
So, in Galilean relativity the fact that the laws of mechanics are the same whether they are observed by an observer on the truck or by an observer on the ground as long as the relative velocity between them is a constant which is really how you recognize an inertial frame of reference. This is the principle of inertia which was identified by Galileo that the laws of mechanics are exactly the same in all inertial frames of references. This is a fundamental principle of Galilean relativity, which essentially means that whatever principle of causality and determinism explained the dynamics, whenever equilibrium changed and in Newtonian mechanics we explain this by <coughs> by invoking a cause generating a certain effect which manifests as the change in momentum at a rate which is dp by dt. This cause effect relationship remains exactly the same for any two observers who are moving with respect to each other at a constant velocity and such frames of references are the inertial frames of references. What is implicit in this statement is that the notion of time is the same for all observers. This is something which we did not explicitly mention earlier, but it is implicitly understood that the notion of time is exactly the same for both the observers, whether you are talking about the observer on the truck or the observer on the ground, regardless of which observer you are talking about. <coughs> the notion of time is essentially the same in all inertial frames of references. So, whenever we talk about velocity and we ask this question what is the velocity of an oncoming car? What is implicit in this question is always the idea of the observer, who is talking about it, who is measuring it, relative to whom. This is an important consideration and this is best stated in the famous chicken crossing the road jokes which you might have read about. There are thousands of answers on the internet on why did the chicken cross the road, these are great jokes the internet is flooded with these jokes and you will find several answers. One of which is this that the chicken could actually be wondering as to why it is the road which is crossing her, because who is crossing whom is a question of relativity and this principle really needs to be understood. We have to keep at the back of our minds these considerations that which observer are we talking about. <coughs> I am sorry about my throat, but let us hope we can go through this. So, let us do it from first principles. We have got an inertial frame of reference, this is the red frame of reference. This is an inertial frame of reference. So, the sub -sub subscripts are i for inertial. So, this is the origin and then you have got an x, y and z axis and related to this frame of reference, we now consider another frame of reference, which is moving at a constant velocity u subscript c, c for constant. So, this frame of reference moves at a constant velocity with respect to this. <coughs> in other words both are inertial frames of references. The displacement vector between them is obviously this velocity times time. So, this is the relative difference between the origin O prime and O i if the two frames coincided when you start your time clock. Now, let us say 
but an observer in this frame of reference looks at a certain object and in his frame of reference the position vector of this object is r at the instant t, which will this object could be in motion and it could change from time to time. So, I write it as a function of t. What is the position vector of the same object for the other observer? It is r prime of t and you know from the triangle law of addition that this red vector is the sum of this black vector plus this blue vector. <coughs> so, that is simple enough <coughs> this black vector is the displacement vector which is u c times t <coughs> and now if you take the time differential of this vector d r by d t then you get d r by d t equal to the rate of change with respect to time of this and the derivative of this term gives you this constant and if you flip this equation for the velocity measured by the second observer in this blue frame, then the velocity of the same object measured by an observer in this is not equal to the velocity measured by the first observer, but he must subtract his own velocity with respect to the other observer. Now, this is common experience. <coughs> now, what would happen if what they are looking at is not just a cricket ball or a truck or a car, but what they are looking at is light. The object over here, this purple thing, okay. This is what both the observers are observing. It is a velocity of this object that these two observers are measuring and we are asking the question, will their observations be consistent with this expression over here, if what they are looking at is not just a truck or a car or a plane, but it is light itself. Does this relation still hold and it turns out that this is where the finiteness of the speed of light plays a big role and we will see why that happens and how this is to be addressed. Now, speed of light it our normal expectation of the speed of light from our common experience, common intuitive expectation of the speed of light is almost that it is like instantaneous. The moment you light a candle, you see the light and you get a feeling that light takes no time at all to travel from the source to the observer, which is equivalent to saying that the speed of light is infinite. Now, there is no point making guesses, one needs to make observations, measure it. So, you need to have good measurement device, some nice experiment that you can set up, so that you can measure the speed of light and you can have some identification of how much time light takes <coughs> to travel from the source to the observer. So, the first good experiment on the speed of light was made by this Danish astronomer Ole Romer <coughs> and what he did was to observe at one of the moons of Jupiter and Jupiter has several moons, uh, Io is one of the well known moons. What he did is that when this moon, this is Jupiter's moon as it goes and circles Jupiter, when it goes behind Jupiter it gets eclipsed, right. So, it will not be seen from the earth. <coughs> so, there is a certain time interval which must lapse between the time at which you sight the moon on one side of the Jupiter and when you sight it on the other. and you record the timing of the eclipses of Jupiter's moon. So, this these are the observations which Romer 
carried out in 1675, 1676 there about these were the first fairly accurate measurements of the speed of light. What he did was to perform these measurements also when Jupiter was at a different part of the sky. And if you remind yourself <coughs> that the orbit is slightly elliptic, then the time that elapses between these eclipses of Io would be slightly different when Jupiter is in a different part of the sky. And from these differences, one can arrive, one can get an estimate of the speed of light. So, this is the technique which Romer carried out. In fact, he only noted the observations, the calculations were actually done by Christian Huygens. He used Romer's data to calculate the speed of light and he found that it is finite, it is very large. He got an answer which is not too far from the presently known value for the speed of light. I have not recorded it over here, but you can find it in literature easily, which is Romer's measurements. Uh, he got an answer which was fairly good, very high, but finite. So, this was the first observation of the finiteness of the speed of light, that it is not infinity. No matter how fast light propagates in space, it does not propagate at infinite speed. There is a finite speed of light. The better known measurements are of Michelson and Morley and what they concluded is what they had hoped to disprove that the speed of light is different for different observers, but they ended up proving that it is the same in all inertial frames of references, but I will not go into that history. But they reported this in 1887 American Journal of Science and here is a picture of the experiment which they set up. What they had done <coughs> was to use spectroscopic techniques and they mounted their apparatus on a solid stone block which was floated on a pool of mercury because mercury is very dense, so it could support stone and then they could actually rotate this stone through 90 degrees. The idea was to measure the velocity of light in two transverse directions and they found that it turns out to be the same and essentially the conclusion was I will not go into the history of this experiment or the details of this experiment, but focus on the conclusion of this experiment that light travels at constant speed in all inertial frames of references. Now, this was the main conclusion that we have to come to terms with, which is really shocking if you have the earlier equation in your mind that dr by dt <coughs> is equal to dr prime by dt plus or minus that u c, right. So, there was a constant term that had to be added or subtracted. So, the observer had to take away his own velocity with respect to another, another inertial frame of reference to get the correct velocity of an object and you cannot do it with light. So, this was a very shocking result and here at the bottom of the slide I give the correct value of the speed of light this is what is approved by the core data, this is, these are the standard values. It is not just three, <coughs> there is of course, a you know um, 2.99792 etcetera, 10 to the 8 meters per second. Uh, this is the currently accepted value of the speed of light. And I, those of you who are interested in the history of this may visit this website of the American Institute of Physics, in which it is also pointed out that it is perhaps not the Michelson Morley experiment itself, which was the main motivation for the development of Einstein's theory of relativity, although it may have played some role, 
but it is not obvious that it was the main consideration, because there were many other things going on in physics. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to what was known at the time in the subject of electrodynamics. <coughs> the Coulomb's law was known, Ampere's law was known, Gauss's law was known, Faraday's law was known, and I am not going to go through this, but just draw your attention to this. I presume that you would have either studied these things in some other subjects in some of the classes or else a little bit of introduction to some of these things we will have also in later part of this course. And let me bring out a very fascinating aspect of these experiments which come from the application of all of this put together, the Coulomb's law, the Gauss's law, Faraday's law, Ampere's law, Faraday Lenz law, everything put together. You do this experiment, suppose you have got a certain region of space and in this region of space you have got a magnetic field B, this is a vector and I choose a vector field B which is pointed into the plane of the screen that you are looking at. So, if this were represented by an arrow, <coughs> you would see the tail of the arrow. And you have got as <coughs> a circuit, this loop, this is an electrical loop, it is stationary. This is the experimental setup and the question we ask is, will there be a current in this loop? If there is a current, would it be clockwise as you are looking at it or would it be anti-clockwise or will there be no current at all? And the answer to this question of course, is that there will be no current. right? you just have got a magnetic field, uh, you have a static loop, there is no reason to find a current in it. Now, what you do in your next experiment, you drag the circuit to the right at a certain velocity. Okay. You have got the same setup, you have got the same magnetic field and in the region of the magnetic field, you have this circuit, uh, you drag it to the right. Now, will there be a current in the loop? Yes, because if you were to think of a positive charge over here, this would seem to be dragged to the right. <coughs> so, it would experience a Lorentz force, <coughs> which will accelerate it in this direction and set up a current, which will be clockwise that in real circuits, it is not the positive charge which moves, but the negative charge which moves in the opposite direction is a different story. That is a minor thing, that is another relativity, but no big deal about it, that is just about the sign of the charge. So, that is not an issue here. So, we know that there will be a current, there will be a clockwise current. Now, what we do is we do the same experiment, we keep the loop static we do not drag the loop to the right, but instead we drag the magnetic field to the left. The magnetic field could be generated by a horseshoe magnet or something and you move that magnet. Okay. So, you can move the magnetic field itself to the left. <coughs> now, if you are to ask this question, Q into V cross B, this V is the velocity of the charged particle, which is a particle of the loop. Now, that loop itself is static, you are not moving it. So, you cannot think of any force in terms of the V cross B, right. The Q V cross B term in this case cannot be invoked, 
because this charge is at rest, you are not moving it. In your frame, it is not moving at all, but the result is the same that there is an identical current. And furthermore, if you do this experiment in which you move neither the loop, the electrical circuit, nor the magnetic field, you do not change anything, but just decrease the strength of the magnetic field, just change the magnitude of the magnetic field. <coughs> Even then, you find that there is a current. Now, this is an incredible result and more than anything else, perhaps more than Michelson Morley experiment, it seems that it is this experiment which prompted Einstein to come up with the theory of relativity and reinterpret notions of space, time and the finiteness of the speed of light and everything else that would follow. Now, all laws of electrodynamics are contained together, they can be packed together in Maxwell's equations and you can do a little bit of vector calculus with this and these are well known relations. You can do a little bit of further calculus with this and arrive at the so called wave equations. <coughs> Excuse me. And what these wave equations tell us is that the electromagnetic field propagates at a certain speed, which is given by the square root of 1 over mu 0 epsilon 0. So, this is the magnetic permeability of free space this is the electric permittivity of free space and this gives the speed at which the electromagnetic waves travel in space. This comes straight out of Maxwell's theory. What Maxwell observed that the speed that comes out of this calculation <coughs> is exactly the speed of light this is the speed of electromagnetic wave, which turns out to be exactly equal to the speed of light. And therefore, Maxwell concluded that electromagnetic waves and light are the same physical phenomena. Okay, this was his conclusion. And you have the electromagnetic field, the electric vector and the magnetic vector orthogonal to each other and the disturbance itself propagates in a direction which is orthogonal to both of them in the direction of E cross B, that is the pointing vector. Now, this was known at Einstein's time as well as the Faraday lens experiments. Now, what is interesting is that the speed of light turns out to be given by properties of vacuum mu 0 and epsilon 0. Nowhere did we talk about who is measuring it, in which inertial frame is he. <coughs> and therefore, the speed of light must be the same in all inertial frames of references. because the Maxwell's equations are correct in inertial frames of references. The speed of light is determined only by properties of vacuum. Therefore, the speed of light must be the same in all inertial frames of references, even if they are moving with respect to each other at a constant velocity. Now, this is the conclusion that Einstein arrived at and if the speed is to be the same, then he had to worry about what is speed. Speed is after all the ratio of distance over time and if speed is the same, 
may be the, what constitute this ratio distance over time, distance in the numerator and time in the denominator. Distance over time giving the speed, speed being the same, may be this distance and time adjust in some strange way, which we had not known before. And that would explain the constancy of the speed of light in every inertial frame of reference. This was Einstein's reasoning. <coughs> what you see is that the special theory of relativity and the theory of electrodynamics are intimately related. They are intimately connected. There is a fundamental connection between the two. And this is what the special theory of relativity is about. Both of these topics, electrodynamics and the special theory of relativity, belong to the framework of classical mechanics, which is why an interaction to both of these topics is included in this course. They are absolutely intimately related to each other. Electrodynamics contained in Maxwell's theory and special theory of relativity formulated by Albert Einstein. And we will now see how our understanding of how transformations are to be carried out from one frame of reference to another. And we had done this all along using Galileo's laws of transformation. How velocity and accelerations in one frame of reference are related to that in any other. Whenever we discussed this topic earlier in our earlier discussions in this course, we made use of Galilean relativity in which time was considered to be the same in all inertial frames of references. We will have to, <coughs> we will have to refine these considerations. And Galileo's laws of transformation will have to be replaced by Lorentz transformations. So, we will introduce ourselves to Lorentz transformations. Now, all this happened in the year 1905, which is famously described as Einstein's miracle year. It really was a miracle year because Einstein did so much in that one single year. It is in amazing to understand how a human mind could be as productive in such short an interval of time as Einstein's was in the year 1905. I do not know of any other period in the history of mankind that there has been so much of an intellectual burst in a small period of time in one year. What Einstein did in this year was to explain the Brownian motion and this became the framework of understanding of stochastic processes and Einstein had a very famous paper on this. Same year Einstein explained the photoelectric effect which was observed in the experiments of Hertz and Lenard and this is the work for which Einstein eventually got the Nobel prize. The means of course, Einstein had contributed a lot. <coughs> but his interpretation of photoelectric effect is the one that was explicitly mentioned in the citation for his Nobel prize. And then of course, he came up with the theory of relativity. And these are the consequences which I call as STR upshots, STR for special theory of relativity. that physical laws are the same in all inertial reference systems. Now, this point by itself was not completely new at Einstein's time, because we had it even within the framework of Galileo and Newtonian mechanics, but it was tested only for motion of mechanical objects, means of course, at Galileo's and Newton's time there was no electricity was not understood. 
<coughs> Coulomb's law and Maxwell's equations and all of this came later. So, at the time of Galileo and Newton electrodynamic events were not analyzed. So, this conclusion that physical laws are the same in all inertial reference frames which is and this particular statement provides the framework of Galilean relativity gets incorporated in Einstein's theory of relativity as well with the difference that it now becomes applicable <coughs> not only to the mechanics of particles as was done at the time of Galileo and Newton, but also to electromagnetic phenomena including light. Okay, light is electromagnetic wave as we have already reconciled with. Second that the speed of light in vacuum is a universal constant. This is the fundamental reality, the fundamental stipulation which became a part of the essential framework on which the theory of relativity is built. That it does not depend on the state of motion of the observer or of the source of light, even if the source of light is moving it would not matter. So, these are the some of the important upshots of the special theory of relativity. There are other consequences that the maximum velocity anything any object can take <coughs> is that of the speed of light it cannot. So, there is a light barrier as it is called you cannot cross that barrier and then there are rather you know very unusual kind of consequences that we had not imagined in the pre Einstein era. And these are the contraction of the length scale the objects appear to contract in the direction of motion and that the rate of moving clock seems to decrease as its velocity increases. So, this is called as time dilation and these are completely new ideas new from the point of view of Galilean relativity and these are some of the consequences that came out and we will see why this happens. There are other consequences which lead to the equivalence between mass and energy and they are also interchangeable and there were several other consequences I will mention some of them <coughs> and why is this important for us. If for no reason at least for the fact that any Tom, Dick or Harry even two monkeys they talk to each other on cell phones these days. So, let us not live in a world in which we think that the theory of relativity is of no relevance to our lives it affects our lives directly. Because even the cell phones work the way they do because the theory of relativity is correct. If you were to use laws of physics and electronics without reference to the theory of relativity you will not be able to come up with devices such as the cell phones. Now, let us see why this happens and this is how the cell phones work. They if a fundamental principle that is employed is the global positioning system right the GPS and you are carrying it in your pockets. And they have these receivers which <laughs> get the signal from these satellites there are about 24 GPS satellites <coughs> and these GPS satellites must you know there should be a certain minimum number of satellites which can connect to the receiver and you throw in some triangulation and so on and then you can position where the receiver is 
and you must take into account the speeds at which the satellites are moving and these speeds are not these satellites since they are moving relative to you. What is length and time for you is not the same as length and time on the satellite. But there is another reason for it, uh, which actually comes from the general theory of relativity, but I will comment on that a little later. And it turns out that the theory of relativity is absolutely important. And if you did not take account of these things, then the GPS system will not work. And this is one of the very many reasons why not only scientists, but engineers, electronics engineers, communication engineers, those who, who, who produce these devices using dielectric materials and so on. So, material scientists, chemists, they all need to have some understanding, some introduction to what the theory of relativity is about. This is what is called as a special theory of relativity. Relativity because you compare observations by two observers who are in motion relative to each other. So, there is a relativity. Special because it turns out to be a special case of another theory which Einstein formulated later, which was in 1915-16, toward the end of 1915 actually, which is known as the general theory of relativity, <coughs> which is actually well beyond the scope of this course, but I will make a few comments about it. So, essentially we are going to focus on how do we interpret the physics that is seen by two observers, who are in motion with respect to each other at a constant velocity. Okay? So, both the frames of references are essentially inertial frames of references. This will be our topic of discussion. Our main conclusions are the following, that Maxwell's equations are correct in all inertial frames of references, no dispute there. Maxwell's formulation predicts that the electromagnetic waves and light propagates at a speed determined by properties of vacuum, no dispute there. Now, if you put 1 and 2 together, do it in your minds quickly. You must conclude that the speed of light is the same in all inertial frames of references, whether you like it or not. You cannot escape the consequence contained in statement number 3, if you have come to terms with statement number 1 and 2 you cannot escape. What this will force us to do is that we must change our notion of time and Einstein was smart enough to do that and he was courageous enough to do that, because it is a very bold idea exceptionally bold idea and Einstein stipulated just that. And then our notion of space must also change, because after all speed is distance divided by time. So, if speed of light has to be same in all inertial frames of references, then somehow distance and time these two must adjust to each other in such a way that the ratio that they generate for light turns out to, the, to be the same in every inertial frame of reference. This will become very clear when we discuss the twin paradox. So, at this point we will take a break, I um, will be happy to take some questions. contraction and time dilation occur simultaneously or are they two different phenomena? Both are automatic and essential consequences of just one fact, 
that the speed of light is the same in every inertial frame of reference. Length contraction is not a new postulate, nor is time dilation a new postulate. There is just one fundamental reality that the speed of light is the same in every inertial frame of reference. If you accept this and you cannot escape from this, the moment you accept it, you cannot escape from the consequences. And the consequences are very many 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay? Let me mention the third and the fourth consequence before I come to the first and second. So, there are a number of consequences of this okay. and you have to accept all of these consequences. One of the consequences is that the electron, electron must have an int int intrinsic spin. Another consequence is that mass energy and energy are equivalent, interconvertible. Okay. You cannot escape from any of these consequences and the consequence number 1 and 2 that we are directly talking about is length contraction and time dilation. You have to accept all of these consequences together, it comes as a package. So, it is not that one leads to the other, it is not that consequence A leads to consequence B leads to consequence C, it comes as a package. Is that clear? Any other question? <coughs>